I'm on Anschutz, but I'm in this Colorado School of Public Health. So the things that I tend to look at are population level. And uh, one of the things that we found really interesting was when we looked at where, where cannabinoids deposit once you've used them in the environment, it turns out nobody knows. So there's, a se there's secondary exposure, so people know that if you're exhaling in the environment, that people who are inhaling that can get, um, can get blood levels of cannabinoids. Um, but they don't know about what's happening on surfaces because nobody's looked. So we did. Um, like I said, I have, uh, I've, I have no conflicts in here, but I'm the co-PI of the, of the CDPHE funded study on sleep. So we just mentioned that before. We've got about a 150, 160 sleep studies that we're going to be reporting on fairly soon. We had to have some of them rescored, so I couldn't talk about that today. So the context for this is, uh, you know, 22 million people using cannabis according to, uh, to NIH. Um, that the, one of the primary methods of using it is vaping, vaping and smoking, so um, you're going to be ingesting cannabis using your lungs, and slightly controversially, um, there's a belief that when you exhale, you're not exhaling too much in the way of THC, um, but there's, quite, there's actually some very good research that says you are uh, exhaling um, things that can, can affect the environment, and those elements can deposit on surfaces and potentially cause exposures to people um, who aren't using cannabis. This specifically shows up like if you're legally using cannabis in your house and you have a kid and the kid comes in the same room as you're in uh, or plays with toys that have been in that same room, they might end up with a dose and you don't want that to happen. Um, so some of the definitions in here, uh, secondhand smoke, environmental smoke is the general term for the smoke that non-smokers are exposed to. Mainstream smoke is the smoke that you breathe back out again, that, they, that you exhale after having inhaled. Um, side stream smoke is the smoke that comes off of, for instance, a cigarette or a joint or, or uh, other ways of entering the environment. Uh, and that results in involuntary or passive smoking um, in, from uh, using the terminology from, from tobacco, but it, it, should, it should apply to, um, to cannabis as well. And that would, could possibly result in a tertiary exposure where these, expo where these molecules land on things and then when you touch them, that might cause an exposure of some sort and you sh we should know that. Um, so a little bit of uh, cannabis pharmacokinetics. Um, if you're smoking, it turns roughly 50% of the THC into smoke. Uh, then 50% uh, of that is exhaled, making the bioavailability of smoke THC between 10 and 25%. But um, the vaporizing, we know quite a lot about because of a very nice study by Hazen Camp using volcano vaporizers um, where they captured all the THC that went in and all the THC that came back out. So they captured all the exhaled breath as well. Um, and what they showed was a volcano will deliver 54% of the available THC, plus or minus depending on the temperature, with very little side stream exposure. And uh, then when you exhale that vapor, you're exhaling between 30 and 40% of the dose that you inhaled. Um, so that's the, that's the exposure we're trying to look at. And luckily, what we have access to, and Emily Lindley is going to talk, to talk about this in a little bit, is a state-funded study of cannabis used for pain, where she is dosing people with 5% NIDA product in uh, a room on campus in University of Colorado. It's double-blind, placebo-controlled, and cannabis is delivered with a volcano vaporizer. So a little bit, as, as Marie mentioned and other people have mentioned, cannabis dosing on campus can be a problem. Um, they can't, people can't dose with anything that they actually have. They can only use NIDA product. Um, and what the campus did was they built a special room so that people could, do, so that studies could dose people in that room. It has a high airflow. It turns over the it turns over the volume of air in the room once every two minutes. Um, so supposedly that's going to suck all the air out um, and uh, vents it to the roof so it doesn't cause exposure to other people in GCRC. Right. So they're, 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 the the university did that in order to do these kind of NIDA studies. Um, so what we thought was that seems like an excellent place to go and do some surface sampling because um, since we know that we know exactly what's being used, we know that it's NIDA product, we know how much has been used, um, then we can sample from surfaces and say something about how much is deposited from, from potential tertiary exposures, right? And we're going to use IC42 lab on campus to do this testing, and they did that in a very helpful way. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, there's a lot of words next to LC, MS, MS, and I don't know what any of them mean, but that's appropriate. Um, so, <laughs> uh, and the, the important part for me is that the lower, lower limit of quantification is 2 nanograms, and the upper limit is around 100 nanograms, um, based on their ability to use DEA pure THC samples so they can, they can detect very, very small amounts of, um, of THC. And we, we could eventually do this with other things, but right now we, we're just going to talk about THC. So the, the pain exposure study uh, is, it do doses people between uh, 20 milligrams and 40 milligrams of THC 
uh, that's based on uh, having one bag as uh, one um, uh, we call it a bag um, that the that the volcano vaporizer creates, and they can make the choice to have another one because some of the, these people are in pain now, um, and they might need a larger dose in order to alleviate that pain. Um, and looking back on the on the hit, on the, the study I mentioned before. It, we should be seeing exhaled around 3.8 milligrams of THC for a single bag exposure. Um, at the time that we did the sampling, 13 studies, 13 subjects had complete, completed all phases of the study. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, on these. Um, and four, I believe four had completed at least one of the study visits um, out, of, out of all of them. So we, we're fairly confident in saying that the room itself has been dosed with roughly 49.4 milligrams plus or minus around maybe 15 milligrams um, depending on if all four of those people who had the um, who hadn't completed their study visit had had a THC study visit so we know pretty close to how much THC has ever been used in that room because the study the room's never been used for any other THC study and it was remodeled for your study right okay my, my, the sampling protocol that we came up with was using isopropyl alcohol because we know that the THC molecule is polar, so um, it seemed like that was something we could try out since no one had ever done this before we had to invent the protocol. Um, we used three tabs per surface, and we chose a, a, a surface that's the size of a, um, a piece of printer paper, so we know exactly what the surface area is. We sampled it using um, uh, the first tab, you would use one pattern, the second tab, you'd use a different pattern, the third tab, you use a different pattern and they all get pushed, uh, pushed into borosilicate vials for transport for IC42. So uh, we think, and uh, of course we were in gloves the whole time, nothing's contaminated, you swap the gloves between every sample um, so that nothing's cross-contaminating um, the samples that you're getting on the actual swabs. And it's just a small medical room, there's nothing special about it, but we're sampling you know, surfaces like the table and like the floor and the chair that the person sits in, okay? So what we found, was um, first of all the floor was very dirty and we're going to go back and talk to the hospital about that. So we couldn't get a sample on that. <laughs> um, the, we did get uh, detectable limits on four of the surfaces um, that we checked. The game is a is a small metal game with keys in it that the, the participant has to once they've used cannabis they have to put place keys into it as I understand it. Um, a doorknob's a doorknob. Uh, we sampled around the base of the volcano vaporizer itself and these two these uh, tables have uh, uh, could potentially be cleaned, so we don't we're not 100% sure whether they were cleaned like immediately before we tested or not. Um, but we definitely got uh, quantifiable levels of THC off of four of the surfaces that we sampled, uh, and that's with that ex I would consider a very small exposure from a vaporizer, exhaled breath vaporizer. Um, came back for a second visit where we decided to do a couple of experiments. And we collected samples um, from the same table as before to see if we were picking up sample again based on these other these the the, the subsequent four or five um, study visits. Uh, and we did after sampling that surface, we went away and came back to it 20 minutes later, sampled the same surface again, and then uh, we collected samples from a place we hadn't sampled before across a window, where we um, delineated three spaces and then used a different number of swabs on each one of them to see if you needed to disturb the surface to get the THC off. Uh, and then the last thing, we introduced a clean object into the room, left it for one vaping event, brought it back and tested it again, right? And we also collected um, control surfaces from all over the place. Results are from the, t the t this is the table that we didn't get a sample from before. In this case, when we came back and sampled it again, we got uh, quantifiable levels. We went back to the same surface, did three more swabs and got lower quantifiable levels. So from a public <laughs> health perspective, that's a suggestion that maybe it, it, it takes a certain amount of cleaning, but you can remove the THC from the surface if you're trying to. Um, it, we're we're going to go back and do this again. We have a grant in uh, to, to NIDA to do some more environmental sampling and, and make a good public health message about this. And on, this, on the windowsill, we used three swabs on one of them, two on the other, one on the other, and only detected it on the one using three. Once again, possibly suggestive that you need to disturb the surface in order to get um, cannabinoids back off of it again. The game came up so, uh, positive, and it, it takes more than one dose uh, of exhaled smoke to affect the toy that we brought in the room. But we also don't know whether or not there was a THC-based visit, because um, this study hasn't been unblinded yet. Uh, all of our control services were negative. The first control services in the, the meeting, meeting room that my faculty, my fellow faculty used in the University of Colorado, and there was no cannabis on that. I, just, I wanted to report that back to the university. Okay, five minutes, okay. Uh, so in conclusion, see, I got to the conclusion. 
Uh, <laughs> so, so THC can be detected in quantified on surfaces in rooms exposed to exhaled vaporized cannabis only. I would, I'll say only, and maybe people would argue with that. Um, potentially cleaning a surface that's been exposed to airborne cannabinoids may, uh, may be accomplished with a polar solvent. So eventually we want to make a suggestion if you're, clean if, you're, if you're using legally in your home and you want to not expose anybody else in your home, what do you have to do to clean up? And I think that's an important message to pass on to people. Uh, it still remains to be seen whether this surface detection actually represents potential tertiary exposure to humans. The, t the terpenes are, I mean, the, the cannabinoids are there, but I don't know if you put your hand on it, if any of them get on you. Uh, that's a lot of, quite a few experiments down the road, but we'll eventually try to do that if we get funded. Okay. And once again, thank IC42, thank Emily for letting us use her room, and thank our, our uh, Colorado <coughs> Cannabis Research Consortium that is not funded, but is very, very active. So. Thank you.